It is July the 21st, 2022. I'm Chris and this is Curiously Polar. And we're back with Mario and Henry. It's like good old times. Hello. <laughs> good old times. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. How are morning, you guys morning, doing? Morning. Quite okay. I, I'm good? glad to be back. Yeah. Yeah, a bit of a so bit of a sore throat on Mario's side. <laughs> yeah, I'm just recovering from a cold, so I apologize for this uh, deep nasal voice. <laughs> I think it makes you makes you more more radio-y sounding. So it adds it's something good. to it. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> it is all good. Um, let's see. We have a chock full episode for you guys today. Uh, where do we start? News topics about polar bears, about uh, border, about ice formation and earthquakes. That's a nice bouquet of mm. interesting topics. So let's uh, start with the first one. You, I think Henry brought this on. No, actually, we found out when preparing this episode that um, we are going to have a lot of content today. <laughs> So let's kick this off with the polar bear population. No, let's take the polar bears for the main topic. Oh, let's wait for yeah. the, let's wait with this for, for okay. Then let's go on and look at uh well, a new border. <laughs> a new border. Uh, okay, okay. So we take the news reel first. I have been away for so long <laughs> that uh, I do not remember anymore. Yeah, you? well, well, we haven't done a show with the three of us in so long, so I think mm -hmm. we're uh, we're okay shuffling things around a bit. So, yeah. a new border has come uh, has come into existence, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Hans Island. Yeah, Hans hey. Island. Yeah. <laughs> Note Which from base? episode number what was it sixty five? Yeah, yeah, the thing with the with the whiskey yeah. bottle, wasn't it? 56, or rum or fifty six, the whiskey war. Yes. Yeah, it started war. with a cognac bottle, and then it went into uh, whiskey from Canada, and uh, and the cognac from the Greenlanders were changed into Aquavit. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but you know you know who who was Hans? Why was Hans? Hans yeah, Hans's name is actually Suarsak. And uh, he signed his name as Hans Hendrik, and uh, he was a Greenlandic hunter and dog handler that was working up there in 1853 to 1883 as a guide and as a translator and as a rescuer of different expeditions. And he wrote a book that is then translated from Greenlandic in at the end of the last century called the Memoirs of Hans Hendrik, and uh, and and he has this island and a little rock also called after him. Um, he saved uh, a few people, a few important people that were going out there and they didn't know where to go. Well, of course, they were expeditioning and exploring the place that. He was living it, and so it was okay. But he's he's from the south, but or from the west of Greenland. But he came up, anyways. But anyways, so this is Hans, and uh, and his island is not because it's his. He was just uh, named by the what's it called the by Hall, I think. He was called Hans Island. Okay, um, if you look at Hans <laughs> Island. It's almost like a, a circular island, hmm. a, a barren rock. A little bit more well, we than we one brought some kilometers. some map material here. So um, yeah. here's the Library of Congress, I think. Yes. Which has uh, uh, let me enlarge this one for you. So here's here's um, where let me, let me let me try to find it because it is it's huge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really hard to miss, right? Let me go further. No, is it south? Is it somewhere down yeah, here? Yeah, yeah, a little bit south. Yeah. There. Oh yeah, there. Here we go. Uh, the tiny little thing the right in the middle of the screen. Yes. 18 kilometers from each coast. So what's what's what happened? What happened? Well, in the 70s when uh, when Canada and, and Greenland they were uh, defining their their border or like settling the borders, they uh, kind of left out that island. So the uh, there are only there are only a couple of places where there is a, like a little bit of a, um, I wouldn't say disagreement, but in any case where the border wasn't wasn't really settled, and this is the one point that was between in, Denmark the, and Canada. Between, 
between Denmark and Canada, yes, between uh, yeah Denmark because Greenland is Denmark uh, uh, for foreign policy. And now you see the very good ridge that you see in the middle of the picture right now, the video. That's where the new border is coming from and is uh, is settled. And uh, and when the Canadian and Greenland and Danish Greenland uh, uh, authorities ratify the agreement, then it's going to be. It's going to be there. It's the border. You see the ridge that splits the island almost from the top of the picture. This is so funny. I mean, find it's, it's so a, funny a, because the, the Denmark 12, and Canada 12, 25. Having, having a shared border is weird. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's kind it's, of a, a butt. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. In any case, even even if Denmark is getting a little bit more of the island, uh, at least the uh, the this is settled. But the, but the um, there is not just uh, Denmark, Greenland, and Canada that have to agree on the border. But it's also since it's it's going to be a Schengen border, then it will have to be. I think it's I think it is a Schengen border. It will have to be ratified by also by the European Union. And and they will have to give probably an exception that there is no border control on Hans Island. Which, I mean, look at the picture. It seems like, what would, what do you want to control there? There is nothing. <laughs> well, imagine the, the tax-free quotas. I mean, there is always alcohol. There's oh, been okay. alcohol going on uh, across the border for uh, like you know, exactly. 30, 50 years. They've been smuggling <laughs> Aquavit and, and, and whiskey. <laughs> In, in in very small quantities, we have to say, but <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. But I mean, considering the number of people there, and the fact that maybe the helicopter pilots they shouldn't uh, they shouldn't drink. <laughs> There's a lot of alcohol per person per hour on the island, <laughs> and it's one point two eight kilometers of land border, making it the third shortest land border oh. on the planet. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> What's it? What are the two others? Uh, Botswana and Zambia have only 155 meters. <laughs> UK slash Gibraltar and ah, Spain. Ah, that's right. In Spain. 1.2 right. kilometers. That's right. <laughs> oh, well. That's wild. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> that is wild. So Anyways, is that already is... ratified? I thought it was already no, ratified. It's not ratified. It's not. No, it's not ratified yet, but uh, it, it is, is agreed it? upon internationally yes. between the two countries, but now the governments have to ratify it. So it's a, it's a formality, you're saying? Well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. The interesting thing is that the um, solution was uh, driven by the new Greenlandic government, which yeah. came into play. So they proposed that to solve that issue. I think also um, showcasing that they are very well capable of dealing with their own foreign policy um, on their own. So mm. let's see. Yeah, yeah. But it's, right. uh, there is, uh, I mean, NATO allies, and there are like there is a two-layer base right by, like the uh, um, what's it called, uh, uh, Eureka. Uh, there is the uh, Resolute. I mean, there are there are quite a, quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of uh, military activities that is common, anyways, yeah, up there. So it's yeah, and, no, and the fisheries for the moment is also, but the US want to build a new naval base there. Yes, <laughs> for, I, for, I don't think for, that's in for a one space missile. to build a naval base. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. let's move on to um, a space-related mm -hmm. topic. We're talking about mm -hmm. ice forming, but not just on Earth, but uh, a bit outside. Yeah, and I I brought this up to uh, to the attention here because there is a there are double ridge formations in the ice on Jupiter's moon Europa, Europa. And in the black and white pictures there, you can see on the left is what you see on Europa. Uh, and and on the right is what you see in northeast Greenland, in the north of Greenland. That and looks similar. Uh, and they're saying, like, why is this happening? And the important thing is that in order to understand what's happening on Europa, people have been looking at the same formations in Greenland that nobody had understood until now. But they are a little bit more accessible so you could put uh, um, uh, like devices like acoustic devices for doing a uh, cut of the ice that you see now in the red and 
red and yellow picture there and and you can see that there is a double ridge it's a little thing there in the plane in the middle and then you see fern in the violet areas like a little bit more like porous uh, ice uh, snow compact very snow. granular yeah yeah and very granular and uh, and then you have some refrozen ice that is also like a little bit lighter uh, than the violet and under there you have a water table so what happens, and, and this is more explained in a picture further down, is that there is a double ridge indicates liquid water. There is a water table, the liquid water, I mean, on Europa, you do not know, I mean, people don't know why it, there would be liquid water. It could be, it could be uh, from uh, seismic activity, from geothermal activity. It could be uh, some uh, some friction among the um, the ice uh, blocks and the uh, and the substrate or or pressure even. But uh, you see that from the left, the pane A is a, this is an evolution of the ice ridge. So for those that are not watching the video, so if you have a lens of ice. Uh, on top of some liquid water, this ice might crack uh, on top of the of the water, and the water is then forced up, but in in a channel, in between the two ice surfaces, and this forms a kind of a like a diapir, so a a, a, a solid mineral uh, formation that is pushed upwards, and in in this channel and by being pushed upwards this this ice uh, formation forms on the two sides some ridges so you have a double ridge one on each side of the of the extrusion of this diapir uh, this vertical extrusion and this happens in greenland so people are thinking that this is probably the case also in uh, on europa because so we are the, having the, the same physics the significance of that is that uh that uh, Jupiter Moon Euro Europa is uh, one of the prime candidates in our sol solar system for the potential for life in one form or another yes. because it is suspected that it has liquid water and um, that exactly. these ridges these ridges pretty much uh, if they are formed the same way then that would mean that there is liquid water on Europa. Yes. Hello, say hello exactly. from me. <laughs> hello. <laughs> yeah, <I'll do. laughs> Who was that? <laughs> yeah, like so, Korea. Actually, I'm I'm, I'm expecting a parcel. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yes. So if if Henry gets lost in the middle of the episode, then we'll know why. Yes. Um, so yeah, this is this is interesting. So Europa showing the same ridges that uh, that we see in other places yeah. on Earth. So yeah, and I and I take this as a, as a, a two messages, two take home messages. One is yes, Europa probably has liquid water so and and it's not very deep down because uh, i mean it is relatively accessible the other is that studying ice in greenland is not just a pastime that might that people might say it's superfluous and not really useful i mean this is useful for the survival of the species when we'll all move to europa when uh, <laughs> the earth is going to be too hot and we want some ice and some cold. i mean yeah europa is a nice a nice moon, so there. We should we should just move it over to Earth and have. Well, the, the funny thing is, if you look back into our catalogue, um, in a couple of episodes we talked about Europa already. When we talked about Lake Vostok, when we talked about Antarctica, when we talked about um, space science, how it's connected to the science on the polar regions, and uh, remember um, an episode where we talked uh, in depth about uh, NASA and why NASA actually went to research the polar regions. And uh, we also went into all the visualizations NASA is providing. And then we briefly touched on the deep field research on Lake Vostok, the largest um, subglacial lake in Antarctica, um, where NASA really is interested in how can uh, life evolve for millions of years under a five kilometer thick um, ice sheet and projecting that into possibilities at Europa. And um, here we have like the, the next um, example for that, where we see certain features on the surface of Europa and find the relatives of that um, on, on Earth. And that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And uh, of course, like imagine going to Europa and drilling into that water. It must be something where you really want to make sure you're not contaminating the lake. <laughs> And uh, and 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 may I may I um, 
just raise awareness that how, how amazing it is that we do have things in space, in this case the Galileo mission, that are getting close to these planets and moons and bringing home pictures of this kind of a quality. Um, that is just so mind-blowing. So it is, yeah. is mind-blowing and uh and and again we know quite a lot about this about space and there are some areas on earth that uh that get investigated like this double ridge just because we've right. seen something out of out in outer space <laughs> okay it's amazing but uh wonderful yes thank you all right so um looks like we lost we henry see, but that henry. is fine yeah. let's uh, continue with earthquakes in antarctica Yes, and uh, yeah, while you bring this up, yes, earthquakes in Antarctica. Yeah, since uh, August two thousand and yeah two thousand, and uh, there have been a series of earthquakes and more and more earthquakes, and they are in by the Antarctic Peninsula in the Bransfield, also between the South Shetlands and the and the Antarctic Peninsula, and especially if you stop here on this picture here, you see the uh, the the chart, the map of the area, there is a red circle that is just south of King George Island and it is the Orca Sea Mound where uh, the activity is uh, um, most pronounced and it's on a rift between plates and uh, there are seismic stations close by and, and this is the place where there are practically the most earthquakes in Antarctica and um but um the uh, also very neat uh, about this is the way that this has been detected because the uh, seismic stations are not numerous in the area <laughs> so you have uh, uh, two stations on uh, on king george island and uh, if you bring the supplementary material maybe you have that figure one with the uh, with the um, with the stations find the, this. Uh, here this we picture. go you can see that there are uh, two yeah there you have a um, the um, um, the two uh, stations on uh, on King George Island they are uh, actually the one is uh, they're called the uh, AI Argentina JUBA is at uh, Carlini it's the Argentinian Italian program and that is a normal seismographer but the other one this R4DE2 <laughs> it's it is a it is a strange name it is actually a raspberry pi seismographer that <laughs> is on a network that is available for citizen science all over the world and these two are the ones that are the closest to the uh, to the Orca Sea Mound, and they have detected this. And then, if you look at the picture on the left, where you have a larger picture of the Drake and the uh, from South Georgia to um, Patagonia and the Antarctic Peninsula, you see that the other stations that are close by they are Orcadas on the uh, on the South Orkneys, and then you have Palmer a PMSA on the other side, and then uh, further down it is uh, what is a Smai? It is the Hmm. I don't remember what's it down hmm. there. That's the. Uh, that's also Argentina Italian. Yeah. Well, SM. Uh, I wonder SM as a station, but we'll find out maybe later. But uh, but uh, quite uh, quite interesting is that I mean the area is uh, seismic. Uh, Deception Island is a very seismic area, and uh, as we know from. Uh, from from also relatively recent activity, for example, at Pendulum Cove and uh, and there are seismographer around uh, around Deception Island, but they are most uh, they are, they are not seismographer. They are most for the deformation of the crust of the caldera, for the uh, deformation of the of the uh, of cell, the uh, the island itself. And yeah, it's, a, uh, it's an active rift zone clearly yeah. in, in the Brunswick. Yeah. So uh, so well the the. Uh, the uh, best case scenario is that nothing happens out there, but the worst case scenario, or worse, or the most uh, catastrophic scenario is that there is going to be an underwater, uh, an underwater eruption, and uh, when there are lots of earthquakes, maybe it's not a problem because the earthquakes are happening when things are moving and mm. these things are moving, it's okay. But if now the earthquakes stop for a while, then people are going to be hold their breath. 
And by the way, can I say hooray for citizen science? This um, R2D2, no, R4D2 station there, <laughs> what you, what you yeah. said is, is running on a, on, a, on a Raspberry Pi. So for those who don't know, Raspberry yeah. Pi is a little credit card sized computer for like 30 bucks. Yeah. And that is a full blown computer and it doesn't take a lot of energy and you can hook up yeah. sensors and things and it has networking built in. So it is, a, it is a f so easily capable of doing these things with the right tools and there's entire networks of uh, citizen science projects that you can tap into that collect data like uh, like seismographic data there is some that deal with radiation uh, they have little Geiger counters hooked up to them and that kind of stuff so there's a, a whole lot of interesting stuff going on in the field of citizen science I'm really happy to see that there too yeah I, I I was pretty sure that you <laughs> that you like this, and this is called the uh, Raspberry Shake, the uh, the kind of uh, <laughs> the kind of sensor that they have. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, it's pretty pretty neat, and uh, so you can uh, uh, Raspberry Shake or Rapid Shake is a network name. There it's, it is. Uh, if you go, yeah, exactly, Raspberry Shake, and uh, you can also see if you go. Uh, I. I don't know if you have it there, but in the International Federation of Digital Seismograph, Seismograph Networks, so fdsn.org, you can find all the different networks. And uh, um, there is a, a, a quite a, quite good maps of the different networks, including the Rapid Shake. So you can find the Rapid Shake among these networks there that you are showing uh, that Chris is showing on the on the uh, on the screen. Yeah, I can't find it right now. There's too many pages. Yeah, it's like amazing pages. Yes, but uh, but it is um, yeah, it is quite Raspberry there. Shake. Here we go. Let's see. Yeah, if there you find go. Find a map here. Yeah, you have the data loading. Pages. Yeah, it's slow, but yes. there you go. Stations and in the, the network. Wow, map. look at that. <laughs> <laughs> look and at I don't that. know why, but but the the station down there is not directly available so you don't see the triangle there you just see it at troll at the norwegian station but it might be because it's not online so you cannot access the data online directly so these are all no these are all from down there private citizens running yeah. their own little raspberry shake uh yeah. in in all parts of this world this yeah this Including citizen science is like Two big thumbs up here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so Antarctica like having additional earthquakes um, means... Really looking forward when, you, when we come back um, during <laughs> the summer season, <laughs> if there might be a new volcanic eruption. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Yips. <laughs> well, Henry, you are our volcano specialist anyway, so... I would love to see that underwater yeah. eruption uh, in the middle of the Bransfield Strait. Uh, oh my gosh. It, it, we'll have we'll have cooked penguin. <laughs> yeah, not only cooked penguin. I mean, it's the uh, it's the area with the highest tourist traffic uh, in Antarctica. So Ooh. Bransfield Strait, everyone goes Ooh. through Bransfield Strait. So if that stretch would have been just like um, closed for marine traffic, <laughs> I think we can scrap the Antarctic season. That's just <laughs> well. Let's say that after COVID, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stop. gentlemen, let us move on. <laughs> yeah. This was the uh, Arctic, Antarctic po Polar Newsreel. Um, yes. We have a main topic left for you, which is finally we can talk about polar bears. What's going on polar there? Polar bears. Mm. Uh, yeah, um, polar bears. Um, while working on, uh, on the icebreaker, I stumbled ac uh, across this uh, research that a new polar bear population has been discovered in southeast Greenland and we were in East Greenland at the time a little bit further north and um, in preparation of the season there are a lot of different um, of different um, experiences when you talk about uh, polar bears in East Greenland and most experiences out of the um, expedition cruise industry comes from late in the summer when you come uh, when, when you go there in um, August, September, and then you have not many, uh, if at all, polar bears along East Greenland. So when we were preparing the season, we were just talking about um, the likelihood of seeing polar bears, and I was always uh, saying, of course we will see polar bears, we have the ice there, but we don't know how many and um, how often we will uh, meet them. Now we had, had like a huge success in polar bear spotting, there was really um, tremendous amounts of polar bears roaming around, and this new study just indicates that polar bears are 
um, also present in South East Greenland, which is further south um, towards the tip of uh, of Greenland, where there is very few sea ice, very little. And as we all know, polar bears need um, sea ice to live to live on, to hunt on, to breed on. So it's it's their home turf. And as we also talk about climate change and retreating sea ice, we also talk about uh, what happens to polar bears if sea ice uh, disappears. So this study has just di very different approaches um, or very different, um, has a result that can be in uh, interpreted in, in very different ways. But what I find most interesting is that um, the people who run the study did not only um, include um, recent scientific data, but also data that has been um, accumulated in the past 30 years, but also indigenous experiences. And that's really something um, special that they actually uh, talk to the locals, to the people who hunt there in the area and uh, got no local knowledge uh, included into that study. Yeah, and that's um, pretty um, great. We are talking about an area um, at the south eastern tip of uh, Greenland, uh, um, around an island called Skjöldungen, an uh, old um, settlement called Skjöldungen uh, Timarmit, and there we have a map somewhere. Do we have a map somewhere? Is that uh, the map? I think, uh, no. No. This uh, this map is because uh, like I'm a, I'm trying to find a maps more about. You can, you can t I can uh, I can talk a little bit uh, in the meantime while you're trying to look at the map and you can you this is the all, all the information I have it. yeah but you might want to look for Tim Yarmit uh, in uh, on Wikipedia uh, there is a nice can map you spell it for me <laughs> T I M M I yep I A R M I I T Tim Yarmit there it is. Yeah, and you have a map uh, of where it is on the right. You uh, you can you can see the yeah there. So it is in an area. This this location is in an area that is very affected by or very protected by the East uh, Greenland Current, the South uh, flowing current of ice. So it's it's very. It's not very accessible. There was uh, there was an old settlement. Uh, the the area was very important for the Paleo Eskimos and um, and uh, the uh, Christine Later. I mean, these are practically all of these people here. I've been very involved with uh, Christine Later. I know her personally. We worked together. Uh, but uh, Eric Born was my PhD supervisor. Fernando Ugarte. I worked with him several times, and he's the leader of the Marine Mammal and Seabird uh, Group at the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources. Jon Os is the polar bear specialist here in uh, at the uh, at the Norwegian Polar Institute. And Oystein V is in Oslo. At the, he was at the university. Uh, now he is retired. Um, uh, Rune Dietz, a very good friend in Denmark at the now University of Oslo, and Christian Sonne. We did our PhD together. Christian Sonne, Christian and I, and Bea Shapira. I know from the uh, genetic work that she does. And uh, there are even more authors in there. Ten more authors than these. Um, they looked at uh, about thirty years of data. And data is very heterogeneous here. It goes from very detailed satellite tracking of the movement of these bears and uh, and other bears around uh, Greenland, and uh, and then genetic analysis. This Beth Shapiro, for example, from the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, she looked at the genetic differences between these polar bears. They looked at the sizes, and uh, they have samples that are provided by the by the hunters that are using these populations and they analyze these polar bears the data about this polar bear population against other parts of the range of the East Greenland polar bear unit which is one of the 19 units that polar bears are divided upon in the management units around the, around the Arctic that you showed in a picture before from Polar Bears International and they figured out that there is it is very clear that this southeast Greenland population 
of polar bear, this group of bears in southeast Greenland is separated at 64 degrees north, so at the latitude of 64 degrees, in from the East Greenland, so the Northeast Greenland or the National Park population. So the bears actually stay in this area, these, uh, these Southeast Greenland bears stay in this area, and the Northeast Greenland bears, they actually stay in Northeast Greenland. And, and that is particularly interesting. And the there is a founder of this population. If you look at the genetic analysis, it probably a few bears, or if one or two, or just uh, at least two bears, <laughs> uh, a male and a female, they <laughs> were taken down by the ice, by the flow of ice in this area, and founded this population about 200 years ago. So it's a very recent uh, isolation of this group. So they are genetically very homogeneous, and uh, they are also morphologically they can be discerned by the others the other polar bears of the area so of the of the management area because they are smaller and uh, and uh, this indicates a kind of is insularism it's an isolated population but uh, the important part is that they hunt on the freshwater ice so they are not dependent on the marine ice to find the seals so uh, so as they say, there is a hope for the polar bears that even in with the disappearance of uh, of the uh, marine ice, that it is possible for some polar bears to survive. Though there is a big caveat because an isolated and homogeneous population can have diseases that wipe out the whole population because they are not differentiated. A little bit like the same problem that we have with uh, much further back in time with the bottleneck that uh, that um, that uh, selected the the narwhal populations that we have at the moment. So, so in short, the the, the population is separate, but uh, it has also adapted to different conditions, and it's not depending on sea ice anymore. Yes, it's, it is. Yeah. You have to be very careful there. So, the the study indicates that this small population has adapted to the new needs and it's only possible in certain areas and here in that area we have um, a very special combination of um, uh, ocean terminating glaciers so actually the glaciers are um, exposing um, are producing uh, icebergs and uh, an ice melange between sea ice and freshwater ice and that gives them the hunting ground uh, for, okay. for their food and if we have a look at the global Arctic, there are not many places which can produce actually such an environment. So the likelihood of polar bears having a survival spot here or a retreat is just very, very marginal. So it, it can't support um, the entire population. It can just support small groups. Okay, so yeah, we're looking at a, a very specific circumstances that make that possible. Yes, and and even I mean, if you're talking about survival of polar bears, of course, like this is an addition to what could be keeping polar bears breeding programs in, in zoological gardens because we're not talking about thousands of polar bears out of the 26, 24,000 polar bears in the world as estimated. Uh, the total polar bear population is, is estimated. These are polar bears that are, that are quite, uh, I mean, it's quite too few of them to say that these will be able to repopulate the Arctic in case the rest of the populations go extinct. Do we know a but, number? Uh, there are a few hundreds. Okay, uh, it's uh, it's not. Uh, we are we are let's say in a couple of hundreds, but they haven't done. Uh, I mean, it's very difficult to to count polar bears into. I remember Mario, you and I talking about counting whales. So counting animals is always a diff yeah. difficult thing, and particularly if they are roaming like polar bears. Yeah. Yeah. And and these actually talking about the roaming, these polar bears are actually quite interesting because uh, uh, they uh, they are taken if they are taken by the ice to the south, so like with the East Greenland Current, they would uh, then I mean apart from those that go and are lost at sea and then really lost at sea and die drowning out of sea towards uh, Labrador and uh, towards uh, Newfoundland, um, the others that 
managed to get on land on you know, the southern tip of, tip of Greenland, uh, Palmute and these areas there, they actually have a return home function. A little bit like your drone, you know, like you return to, <laughs> to the base where you <laughs> launched it. And they actually wander back. But their their home range is minuscule res- with respect. The normal home range well, from satellite uh, studies of movements of these polar bears is minuscule respect to, with respect to the polar bears in other areas. I mean, we are, we are talking about a few tens of kilometers instead of a few thousands of kilometers for the ones that are that are up in Svalbard in the Svalbard management group and and from the picture that you showed before from the map with the different management areas of polar bears from polar bears international you can see that there are the the uh, green maps which are just the cane basin and the uh what's the mc it's the mcclure uh it's uh, Island. Area. yeah um no, yeah, the uh, the Cane Basin up there in Ellesmere Island, but uh, but uh, the other green group, the MC group, it's the oh McClure Strait. It's McClure Strait. These are the only two. It says McClintock Channel here. McClintock, McClintock yep. Channel. They are the two populations where there is enough data and the population is growing. Then you have the these three areas around the Hudson Bay and around the uh, northern Alaska, the uh, the um, the North Slope Borough that are declining. And then you have the Bering Sea, the uh, the Bering Strait, and the northern Hudson Bay areas, which are let's let's say likely stable populations all of the other populations we're talking about greenland we're talking about labrador we're talking about baffin island not we're enough talking data about, <laughs> we're talking about the the central arctic and the and the all of the russian areas practically yeah. they don't have enough data we do not know how polar bears are doing in these areas and, uh, and that's kind is, of normal when you when when you travel to the areas uh, and see how difficult it is to travel in the sea ice conditions. They are the home yeah. territory for polar bears, yeah. and there is no surprise. Yeah, which makes it even more challenging to uh, to identify measures for protection of polar bears and conservation mm-hmm. of uh, of these. And uh, and you know, this is here. I must say that this this goes hand in hand with with my my surprise when i was up there for the first time and i found out that yeah a lot of these waters are actually uncharted there's uncharted waters and there's there's so much stuff we don't know i i, I was always under the impression that oh we figured everything out we know we have data about whatever we need and finding out that that is not the case in many areas um, and that is it is normal to be not the case um that was a learning experience for me so yeah. It is, uh, and they, and they are dangerous waters, as the people from the ship Ocean Atlantic actually found out this week. That uh, had a, a little problem with uh, a hole in the hull in uh, northeast uh, Svalbard. Mm. Yeah. Are they okay? I found one of many uncharted rocks. <laughs> Probably. I mean, we don't know what happened exactly, but uh, it will be it will be public in not uh, in not so long. But uh, but there are uh, there are quite uh, a lot of dangers out there, and. Uh, and that's maybe fortunate for polar bears because that limits the number of people <laughs> that are going in, the, in these areas and limits the traffic. But it gives us right. a little bit um, also hope when we come back to uh, those uncharted fjords. Uh, a lot of the fjords in East Greenland are pretty much untouched. Um, yeah. We have no idea how they look like, how deep they are, how, how long they are going. And this is the territory where polar bears can retreat, particularly if they can adopt to the freshwater ice and if they learn to um, to survive with that. Then we have quite a, a retreat area. Um, WWF has defined North Greenland as the last sea ice area, mm. where we also have large glaciers um, coming down from, from the ice sheet. So we have uh, quite some retreat areas. They won't serve the whole population. They won't serve as a survival uh, spot, but they will um, probably prolong the survival of, ice, uh, of polar bears. And what's really interesting with that particular um, subpopulation, and that's what's, what is actually the, the find, is that um, from a genetic perspective, they are so isolated. They're the most isolated polar bear subspecies or subpopulation on the planet. So all the other 19 populations which are defined by Polar Bear International are closer related than this polar bear population to any other of them. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's a point where the uh, researchers um, who are the authors of the study suggest to get that uh, group acknowledged as a 20th subspecies. 
yeah uh, uh, management group yeah the uh these are the uh this is uh they have um they're going to be uh, discussing this at the IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And unfortunately, in these days, the uh, uh, red list area uh, of the, the website is under maintenance, so you cannot go in directly. But, uh, but uh, look at the red list uh, uh, of, the, of the IUCN and, uh, and for polar bears, and you'll have the information about the different populations and the status, and, uh, and these are the... Uh, this is uh, quite quite important. And while we are at it, now the polar animals, and this is not on the program. I'll just throw it in for you as a surprise. But uh, you already uh, alerted me for these walruses that are coming down in the North Sea. And uh, there was one walrus that went into the Baltic and was on Rügen, and uh, then went over to Finland. And then the Finnish tried to move it, and. Uh, um, Unfortunately, it died under transport and under anesthesia. And uh, I wonder if they actually had read my article on anesthesia of walruses. But uh, the, um, the other walrus that is right now quite popular is called Freya and is in Oslo. And it has been around the south of Norway. And right now it's in the harbor in Oslo, almost by the opera house. And with lo it, it goes on to boats in the harbor and sleeps on zodiacs and others and creates havoc but it's also that there are lots of people around it and they are curious and i there was a video yesterday on on the news on uh, uh here in, uh, in in norway of a boy on a on a stand-up paddle board that was paddling close to this walrus and then kind of lost the balance and ended up in the water and and rightly the news today is be careful, don't go close to the animal because you might lead to it being killed at one point because it damaged a person. And and this is the main issue here that I want to say is that like, like when we have the contact between iconic megafauna or potentially dangerous megafauna and humans to which we are not used anymore since we eliminate all the mammoth and the and all the bisons and all the others around our areas and uh, it, it, it creates a problem and it creates a problem mostly for the megafauna so knowing where the animals are and uh, it's it's good the animals sometimes they come down to us but it's very important that we keep clear and observant with respect and from outside and like from far away <laughs> as far away as possible actually that's Observe what 800 with millimeter respect. lenses are for right <laughs> yeah yeah and, and yeah. good binoculars and also like do not joke with animals because they even like a, a polar bear we we have, we have seen them <laughs> all of us like you you they look so peaceful Oh, until, they are so cute. They Let me take a they selfie come, they with come the a little polar bit too bear. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway. Exactly. Okay. I guess that brings us... Oh, one more thing. I have to uh, thanks Graeme L. Mason from Madison in Wisconsin for buying me a coffee. Thank you very much. Oh. It's oh, actually that. probably the first coffee that was bought to me. I, I'm sorry I haven't responded before, but we haven't had any occasion. <laughs> and they write, uh, he writes that we love your podcast, Curiosity Polar, and we listen from Madison, Wisconsin, USA. Thank you very, very, very much. Yeah, and uh, this is in reference to the little buy me coffee links that we have in every episode in the description. And uh, yeah, so that's one way to support us too buy us a coffee so there we go that brings us to the end of a very interesting episode we had earthquakes in antarctica we had uh, uh jupiter jupiter moon ice and greenland we talked about a new border of denmark between denmark and canada which is still amazingly weird sounding to me and of course a new population of popular of, of polar bears so anyway we will be back uh, probably in a week from now. Until then, everyone, take care and bye-bye. <laughs>